now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, welcome everyone. This is the, the first in our seminar series this year. This is the GINA online seminar series. So every two weeks we'll have a different speaker. Um, we have a great lineup of speakers this semester addressing sort of the wide range of GINA related research. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Alex G, who's at the Carnegie Observatory, he's a Hubble postdoctoral fellow. Uh, he did his PhD at MIT with Dr. Anna Frabel, um, and he's going to tell us today about the lanthanide fraction distribution in metal poor stars. Um, and again, as a quick reminder, don't forget to mute your microphones just so we don't get too much static in background. Um, if you do want to ask a question, feel free to unmute yourself, or you can uh, ask a question in the group chat or raise your hand, uh, and we'll make sure that question is addressed. Um, so Alex, take it away. Great. Thank you, Mackenzie. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited to tell you guys today um, about this paper that I wrote with um, Maria Drought, who's an expert on um, transient astronomy, uh, and Therese Hansen, who's an expert on uh, metal poor stars, uh, and about the work that we did that's trying to make a connection between these two different astrophysical probes of the rapid neutron capture process. Um, so this is going to be you know, at least for me, it was interdisciplinary within sort of astrophysics because I had you know, started thinking about a whole bunch of different things. I, I just think this is a really fun um, topic and it's, I think it's a very gina -y topic in terms of trying to connect things from the you know, nuclear physics scale up to um, the astrophysics scale. Um, okay, so uh, that did not work. That worked. Um, so as a brief outline, I'm gonna start with um, a, an introduction to the rapid neutron capture process and talk about uh, what we think its origin might be. Then I'll move on to the meat of the Hi, am I back now? Hello? Yes. yes. Okay, yeah. sorry about that. <laughs> uh, my internet connection dropped, and so um, that went away. I'm really sorry about that. Um, <laughs> no it's part for the course, yeah. <laughs> questions, questions going forward, yes. The wonders of our new technological age. Okay, so um, to the rapid neutron capture process. So the rapid neutron capture process, or the R process, is one of the big uh, last unknowns that we have in the origin of the elements. So this uh, over here is a figure showing the uh, isotopic abundances of the solar system. So over on the left, you have like hydrogen and helium, and we know that those are made in the big thing. Um, you know, things like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, magnesium, silicon, and so on, which are, I can't point with my mouse, but it's that middle range, and you can see the iron peak elements peaking at around 56. Um, and all of the heavier elements are made in, primarily through neutron capture processes, through the combination of uh, capturing neutrons and beta decays that can build up um, all of your heavier isotopes. Uh, and I really like this figure because it shows that like, even in the 1950s when they first made this measurement, you could see the effects of nuclear structure in the cosmos, right? Because you see that there's these three peaks that correspond to the rapid neutron capture process uh, and the slow neutron capture process that manifest themselves just in the abundances of our solar system. Uh, and I want to point out two other things. The first is that little bump over in the middle between the second and third peak, which is the rare earth peak. Those will also be called lanthanides in this talk. Um, and then towards the end of my talk, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the actinides, which are at the very right end and are the radioactive heavier. Um, and so the R process, um, as most of you know, is what happens when you have a really neutron rich, very neutron rich environment. Uh, so neutron rich that actually you can go very far away from stability towards the neutron rich isotopes before you encounter a beta decay. Uh, and so this is a nice video from uh, Gina. Uh, and so you start with some seed nuclei, you begin hitting them with a whole bunch of neutrons. And what will happen is you'll basically move uh, all of your nuclei to very, the very neutron rich side and you'll pile up at those three closed magic neutron number shells. Uh, and then after the neutrons are kind of used up, then you'll beta decay back to the valley of stable isotopes. And one of the things to note is that, uh, you know, this is why you have those three peaks in the solar system, 
uh, you pile up at those three uh, uh, closed neutron shells, and then they beta decay back to slightly lower um, Zs compared to the S process, which piles up directly on top of those neutron shells. So these two processes actually make sort of similar elements, but they make them in different distributions. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, this entire thing happens over the course of just a couple of seconds. Uh, and so you need a really extreme environment with a lot of free neutrons, which is very hard to achieve. Both on Earth, it's hard to achieve, but also astrophysically, it's hard to achieve. Because neutrons decay in like 15 minutes. Uh, and so this means that the only time that you actually ever really get enough neutrons to make the R process is by taking material off from a neutron star. Um, and so you can do this basically, we've, we've thought of basically two ways that you can do this. You can do this either in the birth of a neutron star, which is a core collapse supernova, or the death of a neutron star, which is primarily through neutron star mergers. And so core collapse supernova are what happens at the end of a massive star's life. The star collapses, you make a neutron star at the middle, and it launches a shock wave that explodes the star. Um, that shock wave we think is neutrino driven, and in the process of doing that, um, those neutrinos can lift some of the material off from the surface of the neutron star. Uh, it's really unclear if this actually can make our process. The problem is, is that the material that comes off tends to not be sufficiently neutron rich. Um, but if it, if it does happen, then it would happen pretty often. It would happen in basically most core collapse supernova. Uh, every once in a while, in rare cases, your core collapse supernova might have a different type of explosion mechanism, in particular launching really strong jets. And in those cases, um, you might be able to produce a lot more R process material than you. Uh, the other case is neutron star mergers, which is the death of a neutron star. And in order to get that, basically, you have to have two massive stars which start in a binary. Uh, this basically happens 80 to 100% of the time. All massive stars are in binaries. Uh, and then what will happen is uh, one of these stars has to explode, and then the other one explodes. They have to stay stuck to each other. Uh, and then what will happen is they'll sort of spiral around each other, and they're so massive they emit lots of gravitational radiation that shrinks their orbit. And eventually, they'll get close enough that they'll actually merge and spew out material in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, this is not very common. Uh, it's kind of hard to get this configuration of two massive stars that stay together. Um, but when it does happen, it produces a whole bunch of R process elements. Uh, one of the big issues with the neutron star mergers is that they have this delay time. So after you've formed this neutron star binary, you have to wait for it to inflow. And sort of traditionally, people thought that this has been a pretty long, this is a pretty long amount of time. Okay, so one of the ways you might be able to distinguish between these two types of R process sources is if you could actually look in the very early universe uh, and see what the composition of the universe was at that time. So if you had something like a core collapse supernova going off all of the time, you might have very small amounts of R process material. Um, and if you have a neutron star merger, most of the things should have no R process material, and then every once in a while you should see a whole bunch of it. Um, and so it turns out we actually have the ability to sort of archaeologically see the composition of what the universe is like at early times. And this concept is called stellar archaeology. Uh, and the picture behind stellar archaeology is basically, you imagine you're in the very beginning of the universe before there's lots of metals. Someone's calling me. Um, but the, uh, those stars explode, and uh, they spew out these heavy elements, these metals, out into the universe. Some of those metals will then uh, re-collapse re into the various star-forming gas clouds. Um, and that will form some more stars. And those stars capture the composition of the universe at that time. So not all of those stars are going to survive, but some of them will. And over the next 14 billion years, the massive stars will die off, but the low mass stars will stay around to actually be observed in our galaxy today and in other nearby galaxies. And so what I and many other people at GINA do is we go searching for these stars. I'm, sorry, I'm gonna turn off that phone. <laughs> um, is we go searching for these low mass metal poor stars out in the universe and we measure their chemical composition, which gives us a snapshot um, of that early star forming gas cloud and thus indirectly gives us information about what the early stars are like. So we've been studying these stars for decades um, and by doing stellar archaeology, we learned quite a bit about the R process. One of the things that I still think is just absolutely fantastic is that um, there is this universal uh, heavy R process element pattern. So we go out and we measure the composition of all of these, all of these different elements in metal poor stars. And uh, one example is here in red points. Uh, and you compare it to the R process pattern in the sun, which is what you get after you subtract off the S process. Uh, and it's just amazing to me that these things which are happening on you know, billions of years apart have very similar, uh, basically identical patterns of these heavy elements from barium through the third peak. 
Um, and the other thing that we learned is that the R process happens early because we see these stars and they're uh, extremely metal poor, about 1% or sorry, 0.1% of the sun's uh, heavy element content, um, but they have these R process elements. Um, and so, I, you know, there was lots of arguments based on setting these sorts of stars about whether neutron star mergers or uh, supernovae were the more likely R process site. Um, but about two years ago, neutron star mergers got a huge, uh, you know, affirmation that in their favor, which is that we actually saw a neutron star merger make our process elements. So this is um, the famous event called GW170817. Um, this is a really fantastic event. It also happened like one day after I left the um, observatory. So I was very sad that I didn't get to be there for this discovery. Um, but this, it was this wonderful thing where, you know, at, if, when you merge two neutron stars, you don't just make our process elements. You also make gravitational waves from the coalescence of those two binary stars. Uh, and you also make a short gamma ray burst in addition to the R process elements, which will power a radioactive transient. So this triple coincidence was predicted and then was actually observed over here. So this figure um, on the left, it shows the, um, it shows the trace of the gravitational waves that corresponded to this, uh, uh, the compact binary merger. In the middle, you can see that um, the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope actually saw a burst of things from sort of a similar area. Uh, and then eventually, um, astronomers all over the world actually saw a, a very faint afterglow. Um, so that little dot highlighted over there is something that was not there before. And that is this kilonova, which is the radioactively powered transient following a neutron star merger. And it's powered by the radioactive decay of our process element. Um, and so in this kilonova, we saw it in, you know, this is probably the most well-studied astronomical transient in the history of anything. Um, but the, uh, one of the key things is we saw the presence of these lanthanide elements. These are very high opacity elements that create a very uh, unique, long-lived and red uh, a light curve, a, a transient. Um, so that's this bottom right over here. If you look at the red dots over there, that is infrared data coming from this thing, and it lasts for several days in a relatively extended manner that we don't normally see with other um, astronomical transients. So this is really a smoking gun signal that our process elements were made over here. Um, and this direct observation, basically, you know, everyone was really happy because everyone was like, yay, we finally have solved this, you know, 60 plus year old question of where the R process elements are actually made. We now think that it's made in neutron star mergers. And uh, it was such a you know, resounding confirmation that um, Wikipedia decided to finally change its um, origin of the elements figure from saying the R process elements are made in supernova to saying that they're made in merging neutron stars. And so I think, you know, at least over the past two years, um, many people in the general community now have basically said, we think that neutron star mergers are definitely the source of our process elements. But, you know, then people went back and said, well, you know, there's a reason we thought that neutron star mergers are not such a good source of our process element. So back, um, and, and it basically comes down to this delay time. So what this figure is, is it's a um, theoretical, it's called binary population synthesis code. Basically, it, predi it tries to predict um, what the distribution of merging times is for uh, compact objects, including neutron star binaries. Uh, and the issue is that basically they have this delay time. Some of them merge in you know, like tens of millions of years and then others merge in like longer than the age of the universe. Uh, and when you actually think about this, it's sort of a little bit of a problem. So this, um, the first problem comes on the metal core end. So for those stars that form at very low metallicities, it was thought that those merging delay times would be too long to actually produce the R process elements to enrich stars with uh, very low metallicities. Um, so that's what I'm plotting on the right over here. Each point, the, the colored points are two different samples of stars with abundances measured. Each point is an individual star. And the idea is that those on the very left uh, could not be enriched by neutron star mergers because they have this delay time. Um, and another issue that has come up like both in the past and also emphasized a lot more recently um, is that once you actually have this distribution, instead of saying there's a single um, delay time, it, once you include this whole distribution of delay times, you actually can't match. Uh, it's very difficult to match with only neutron star mergers, um, the observed evolution of uh, our process elements inside of the Milky Way. Um, so this is a really nice paper by Benoit Cote that I, I won't really go into right now. Um, and so, you know, I think none of this should really be too much concern, in my opinion. These difficulties can definitely be addressed. And it's some combination of basically changing the delay times through massive binary stellar evolution or changing how you enrich stars because it's sort of a complicated process and um, galaxy formation and merging of different systems can actually help you resolve these issues. 
Um, but I am a person who tries to like think of what observations that we can make to learn about, you know, these things. And so what I started, the, and these types of solutions are modeling solutions where it's like, we have to improve our understanding of these models using other observations and then apply them to the R process. And so I wanted to try and see if, think if there was something sort of more straightforward that we could do to directly compare um, things over there. Um, but I do think like as, as time goes on, we will understand these two things. We will understand massive, massive binary stellar evolution and hierarchical galaxy formation well enough that that will be um, a thing that people no longer debate. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna move on to the thing that we thought uh, would be the next useful thing to do. And it's gonna um, take advantage of the fact that we now in principle are going to have a population of direct observations of neutron star merger kilograms. So the key idea over here is uh, we're going to compare something that we can measure both in kilonovae and in metal poor stars and see if they're the same. Um, so what we're going to do is take populations of kilonovae, which we don't have yet, but we will have, and populations of metal poor stars that we do already have. We're going to measure something that's called the lanthanide fraction, which we can do in both of these systems. And we're going to compare those distributions. So this is really the key idea of this, you know, the rest of this talk. Uh, so I'm going to say it again in like at least one new different way. And so the idea is imagine you go out and you see a kilonova and, a hat, and you measure a lanthanide fraction inside of it. If neutron star mergers are the dominant source of our process elements of the universe, then you should go and look at your metal poor stars and there should be a star that has a lanthanide fraction that corresponds to that kilonova. Conversely, if you go to your stars and you see that those, these stars have a certain lanthanide fraction, uh, then you should also in the future see kilonovae that have the same lanthanide fraction. What is the lanthanide fraction? It is the ratio of the lanthanides, the elements in the rare earth peak, compared to the total amount of our processed mass that is synthesized in a neutron star merger. And so this is something, you know, all of the chemical evolution stuff, we've had this information now for like 10 plus years, 10, 20 years. Um, but the gravitational wave, these kilonova are the thing that we have now that was not available, uh, you know, three years ago. And uh, the people who follow up these transients are very excited, I think, because they're, they're looking for reasons to continue to follow up future kilonova. Okay, so what is this lanthanide fraction? It's the ratio of the, the rare earth elements to all of the R process elements that are synthesized. And it turns out that this is a thing that you can measure in both uh, kilonova and in metal poor stars. So on the left over here is a spectrum of the um, gravitational wave kilonova. Um, so the black over there is the data and then over plotted on top of it um, are models at different lanthanide fractions. So the red model is the one that they said was sort of a reasonable fit. Um, the blue model at the low lanthanide fraction had too much light coming out at low wavelengths, at bluer wavelengths. Um, and similarly, when you get to the really high lanthanide fractions, then you end up with too much light coming out of the red compared to what you see in the actual spectrum. And so actually, this, is a, this lanthanide fraction is a thing that you can measure in kilonovae. And it's one of the few things that is, um, that is actually robustly measured. Um, then the other thing is that when you look at metal poor stars, you can also measure a lanthanide fraction in those things. Because as you see over there, so that figure over there, the y-axis is the abundance of individual elements in a star. Uh, the the x-axis is the atomic numbers of different elements. Um, and the colored points indicate uh, elements that we have measured in those stars. And so you can see the region that I highlighted, those are the lanthanides and we do measure them. And so in principle, uh, we should be able to compute this lanthanide fraction, which is the ratio of the lanthanides to all of the other R process elements inside of these stars. Um, and you know, this could have been done a long time ago, it's just that no one had done it. Uh, and so that's what we did in this paper is that we said, in the future, we'll have kilonova. Right now we have stars. Let's compute the lanthanide fraction of stars so we know what we should expect in kilonova if neutron star mergers are the uh, source of our process elements in these stars. Okay, so you need two things in order to determine what the lanthanide fraction distribution is of metal poor stars. The first is you need to define a good sample of stars. Uh, and in particular, what I mean by good is that we need to be able to have stars where we can be pretty sure that all of the neutron capture elements are from one enriching R process source. And so this naturally puts you to looking at metal poor stars. Um, but then the next thing is, how do you know are the, that these things are enriched by R process or not? And so we sort of thought of two different things. The first is you can take a sample of stars where you're guaranteed, we know from detailed studies of whole bunch of sub elements, that those stars are definitely enriched by the R process pretty much only. 
Um, and so this was a sample that Ian Roderer, who I think is on this call, um, uh, compiled. And we restricted it only to the, um, this, this is restricted to be uh, only stars that have relatively high amounts of europium. Europium is a lanthanide, uh, and it's the easiest lanthanide to measure. So that's the first sample, a pure sample. And then the other sample is a complete sample, which is uh, maybe the pure sample is a bias sample of the entire set. Uh, and so we wanted to cover stars irrespective of their um, europium enhancement. And so what we did is we went to Genobase and took all of those um, stars uh, and we had to make some cuts. So we wanted to make sure that it was primarily our process dominated. So we made a barium to europium cut. Um, and this um, Genobase compilation is, you know, it's just a whole bunch of literature stars, but we checked against the um, our process alliance results who have been much more careful with their selection function um, to make sure that we got similar answers. Um, and so this sample, it should be more complete, but you worry about contamination, which is that neutron capture elements can be synthesized uh, in places that are not just our process. And the lower europium to iron you go, the more likely that you have significant contamination from those sources. And I just want to emphasize that this pure sample, when you talk to stellar archaeologists, usually when we say we're studying our process stars, we're mostly thinking about the pure sample, but not the complete sample. Okay, so these are the two samples of stars that we took. Now, now that we have this sample of stars, how do we compute the lanthanide fraction? Uh, and I think one of the reasons that no one did it before is that we don't get to actually measure all of the uh, elements that we want to measure inside of these stars. Um, so, if, uh, and this figure over here again, the, the red stars, the red, um, sorry, the colored points are the abundances of individual stars and the uh, elements where there's no colored points are places where we don't have measurements of those elements. Uh, in particular, you will notice that um, in the peak of tellurium, iodide, and xenon in the middle over there, that's the second peak. We don't really have very good measurements um, over there. Uh, and so on my wish list is that we will get a big ultraviolet space telescope to measure those things. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, but in the meantime, what, we can, what we've decided to do was use the solar R process pattern, which is this, um, the black line over here, and use that to extrapolate to all of the abundances that we don't have uh, explicitly measured in these metal pore stars. Um, so to go into this in a little bit more detail, um, the first thing is that you know, the solar R process pattern is something that you don't measure explicitly. You have to derive it from the observations because you have to subtract off the S process component. Um, so over here, we plotted uh, four different ways of deriving the solar R process pattern um, in the colored points. So from Arnold et al. 2007, Sneed et al. 2008, those are the main ones that we ended up considering because the other two did not go down to the lowest mass numbers over here. Um, and then what we did is we took all of these elements and we said, let's divide them into some categories based on information that we, we know about uh, these elements based on like our understanding of the nucleosynthesis and the radiative transfer. Um, and so the first key fact is that uh, if you have neutron poor material, material with high electron fractions, you'll basically mostly make elements that are in the first R process peak. So that's these elements over here. If you then have uh, ejecta that comes out in, in new, that is neutron rich, um, then what you'll primarily do is make all of the other elements, elements from the second peak and beyond. Uh, and we divide that into then another two more categories. First, we have the ones um, that form in this neutron rich ejecta, but have low opacity, so low ability to absorb light. Uh, and then we also highlight the lanthanide separately, because those are the ones that uh, sort of are dominating the effect of, um, dominating the light curves of kilonova when we observe them. Um, so these are the three categories that we decided. And, and for this particular case, we just made sharp boundaries over here. But in the future, I hope that someone would do this more carefully and have fuzzy boundaries between these elements. So once you define these three mass categories, then what you can do is you can define three observationally motivated ratios. Um, so the first one is the ratio of um, the red squares to the blue squares. Um, so this is the ratio of the lanthanides to all of the elements that are made in the neutron rich material. And this we think is basically fixed by nuclear physics. This is the fact that we have this universal R process pattern. Uh, and so we can take the ratio in the sun and just use that for all of our different stars, right? So we measured that inside of um, these different R process patterns, all of the different subtractions basically agree for this part. Uh, and that number is, uh, you know, the, the ratio of lanthanides to all of that stuff is about 14%. Um, then what we also do is we say, well, the first peak is going to vary because it's going to change depending on how much material is neutron rich compared to neutron poor in the neutron star merger. And so that ratio is going to vary. Uh, and it's the ratio of the lighter first peak elements to the heavier elements. 
And then finally, the lanthanide fraction um, is defined as the mass of lanthanides, the red square, divided by the sum of all of these masses over here. And these are not three independent ratios, right? So if you have the first two, and then you can measure the, the third one. Um, so just using that very simple equation over there. Uh, and so essentially what we do is we go to all of our metal pore stars. We measure F, which is the ratio of these light first peak elements to the heavier elements. Uh, we do that for all of the stars, and then we use the masses in these uh, categories to determine um, what the lanthanide fraction of each star is. Okay, so that's what we did, uh, and this is really the main result. So we had two samples, as, as I said. Uh, one of them is the pure sample, and the other one is the complete sample. Um, the shaded regions over here are histograms of the stars in those sample, or I guess normalized histograms. Um, and the, uh, the lines are the kernel density estimate, so basically convolving the histogram with a 0.2 dex um, Gaussian, because that's roughly the uncertainty that we have in measuring the um, lanthanide fraction. And one of the things that you'll immediately notice is that the pure sample has overall higher lanthanide fractions, uh, a distribution that peaks around a lanthanide fraction of 10 to the minus 1.5, compared to the pure sample, which peaks you know, something closer to like 10 to the minus 1.8. And this is actually something that was, uh, you know, the, the pure sample is sort of known to be a bias sample of all of the metal pore stars. So here is a figure showing on the x-axis the europium over iron abundance. Uh, the orange points are the ones which are in our pure sample, and the blue points are the ones which are in our complete sample. And you can see that as you go down to lower europium over iron, there's a larger scatter in the total lanthanide fraction. And this is not that surprising because the europium is a lanthanide. So if you select based on europium, you're going to bias your lanthanide uh, fraction inside of your stars. Um, and so uh, this is important because, uh, you know, for those of us who study stellar archaeology, uh, a lot of us focus really heavily on those stars which have the highest europium to iron ratios because those are the ones where you can measure the most types of different elements. And I'm just, you know, as a cautionary tale, this is what a slide that I showed at the Gino Frontiers meeting like two years ago where I said, oh, when you look at the R, the most R process enhanced stars, you have a remarkably low scatter in the lanthanide fraction in the ratio of the first peak elements to the lanthanides. And I said, it's only going to be, it spans only like a factor of four, which is very surprising because in the models, we expect something like over a factor of 10 variation in this ratio. Um, and I think at that time, I was, you know, that statement is technically correct, but the problem is, is that these R enhanced stars are not the whole picture of stars. Um, so I just want to emphasize this because I, you know, sort of got this wrong. And this was uh, something that Therese really helped uh, me understand. Uh, another thing that we uh, can compare is the lanthanide fraction that's computed in the sun, which gives us about minus 1.4, 10 to the minus 1.4, uh, as well as to dwarf galaxies. So Reticulum 2 and Tucana 3 uh, on the right panel are two dwarf galaxies that are small enough that they should have only been enriched by a single event, uh, and that's sort of the range of uh, lanthanide fractions that we have. And what we see is that all of these lanthanide fractions in these um, other systems actually also tend to be relatively high compared to the complete sample. Okay, so that was measuring the lanthanide fraction in stars. We did that both in metal pore stars. We looked at the lanthanide fraction in the sun, and we also looked at the lanthanide fraction very briefly uh, in some dwarf galaxies. So how do you actually measure the lanthanide fraction in kilonova? Um, so the first thing is that naively, you should expect the lanthanide fraction to be very different from kilonova to kilonova. Uh, and the reason is that neutron star mergers eject material in lots of different ways. So um, there's at least four different ways that neutron star mergers can eject material. In the collision of the neutron stars, they will eject something called the polar dynamical ejecta. They'll tidally fling off ejecta, which is what many people sort of considered the canonical R process for a long time. Um, but then also what happens is you end up with this um, accretion disk around the remnant of the neutron stars, and a lot of material is driven off from there, and actually turns out to be the dominant source of material, we think, inside of the kilonova that we observed. Um, but these different ways of ejecting material will actually change um, they have sort of different characteristic lanthanide fractions. So the blue things over here are things that uh, we think should have high electron fractions and should therefore primarily make mostly first peak elements, whereas the red things should be more neutron rich and primarily make the second and third peak elements, and including the lanthanide. And so if you change the amount of mass that gets ejected in these different ways, you're going to get different lanthanide fractions in kilonova, and that's maybe great because we do observe lanthanide fraction variations in metal pore stars. 
Um, just briefly to talk about why this is the case, uh, like why we get these red and blue kilonova, um, the reason is basically because the lanthanides have very high opacity, and what this means is that they are much better at trapping light per unit mass compared to pretty much every other element. Um, so on the bottom left over here, you see the um, periodic table, and I've sort of just highlighted the bottom two rows. So those are the lanthanides and actinides, and because they are in those regions of the periodic table, they have open F shells, so, you know, atomic transitions are S, P, D, F, so the F um, shells are open, and there's a whole bunch of different electronic transitions that can be there. So that means atoms are really good at absorbing light, and that's why the lanthanides have a much higher opacity um, compared to basically all of the other elements, the lanthanides and actinides. Uh, and on the right over there is actually a calculation of this, where you, um, the, the lanthanides are the, uh, the green and the cyan things, uh, and iron is shown in the gray and blue lines. And basically the point is that the opacities are like a factor of a hundred less um, for the iron elements, iron peak elements compared to our process molecules. So this is why the, uh, you know, this is why lanthanides are so easy to measure inside of the kilonova. Um, but then actually going from the opacity, which is what we directly observe to the lanthanide fraction turns out to be fairly hard. And so in our paper, we basically said, we're just gonna take things that other people spend a lot of work um, putting together uh, and we just tabulated, you know, these are all of the different things that matter in going from an opacity to a lanthanide fraction. So you have to do some radiative transfer code. So take the light through the uh, kilonova or take the light through the ejecta. You have to know what atomic data you have. You have to know sort of where the lines are and how well they absorb. Um, different people use different sets of elements because computing atomic data is hard. Actually combining all of those um, atomic, individual atomic lines into a total opacity, um, there's, there's different ways that you could do that. Uh, and then finally, the type of ejecta that you model, like the exact geometry of the ejecta, can actually make a big difference um, on the results as well. And so th the point of this is basically that this particular step is quite model dependent, and I think that um, a lot of interesting work is going to happen in this direction. Um, but as far as the one kilonova that we've observed so far, um, we, these are basically the lanthanide fraction measurements that were done. So the first thing is that um, there were at least two different mass components. You can't, it's very difficult to take a single mass component and have it reproduce the entire light curve. Um, and so there was a blue component, uh, which was lanthanide poor, that happened fairly early. And then there was a red comp component that was lanthanide rich and sort of extended over a fairly large amount of time. And when we're thinking about stars, the stars are probing the, eject the, com the combination of all of these different components, including any ones that were hidden. So if you have a really deep layer of ejecta, that's not going to be influencing the light that comes out at the surface, and it might actually, we might be missing stuff. So with that caveat in mind, um, different groups you know, modeled the observations, um, and some of them modeled directly lanthanide fractions propagating through those, um, you know, the atomic physics and the radiative transfer that I just talked about. Uh, and then a lot, of, a lot more groups basically said, we are not going to do that. We're just going to assume that there's a different opacity for these different components. And all of these ways are successful at modeling the, the, the data. Um, and so there ended up being four groups that um, made direct lanthanide fraction constraints. And one of the things that was really surprising to me is uh, they actually basically got the same answer for the lanthanide fraction. So those four black points over there are four different papers that modeled the kilonova that we have observed so far. Uh, and the size of the points is how much mass they inferred. And those sizes are quite different. They've di they differ by like a factor of three or more. Um, but they actually all, once you sum together both the blue and the red components, um, they actually basically give the same answer for the lanthanide fraction. And so I think this is sort of a pretty good indication that the lanthanide fraction that you infer, um, at least from the visible components, is, pretty, is a pretty robust thing. So the actual value that they inferred by, from all of these things is about 10 to the minus 2.2, a little less than 1%, right, um, of lanthanides. And when you actually compare this to the distribution of lanthanide fractions in metal poor stars, it's pretty low. So the blue line over here is the um, smooth histogram of the metal poor star distribution. And what you see is it's not inconsistent. There are stars that have lanthanide fractions that are as low as what we saw in the GW170817 kilonova, but most of them sh should be higher lanthanide fractions. And similarly, the R process enhanced stars, the ones that I normally think about as R process stars, um, those have much higher lanthanide fractions that are pretty close to what we see in the sun as well. And so what this means, you know, what this means to me is that most of the stars have higher lanthanide fraction, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that you could have a kilonova with low lanthanide fraction. 
But in the future, we should definitely be seeing kilonova with much higher lanthanide fractions. And in particular, 10% of these things should have lanthanide fractions like uh, much higher than like 10 to the minus 1.5. And, and that makes it like a pretty substantive difference in the light curves. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, we have a prediction in some sense for if the most metal poor stars are primarily enriched by neutron star mergers to produce their R process elements, then most future kilonova should be uh, should have high lanthanide fractions. Okay, so going forward, what does this actually mean for those future kilonovae? Uh, and I'm going to take sort of two different perspectives. One of them is, uh, as we observe future kilonovae, what do we have to do to not miss the high lanthanide fraction ones? Um, and sort of the second one is like, uh, uh, what do we expect to see? Uh, and the reason for this first one is that um, this first uh, gravitational wave event is probably the best studied kilonova that we will ever get. It was unusually close by. We will never get, it's very unlikely that we'll get data that is that good again. And so you, in the future, we'll sort of have to do better optimization of what we observe. And the question is, uh, if we mess that up somehow, uh, or like, what do we have to do in order to make sure that we aren't misestimating the length of the fraction? And so what we did on the left over here is we did um, a simple three component model that explains the light curves of um, the kilonova that we observed. There's three components basically. There is an early blue kilonova from sort of the collision of the, that, that can be interpreted as the collision of the neutron stars. There's a disk wind component, which is all of the material that was blown off. Uh, and then there's a very lanthanide rich component that uh, is probably, you know, you can think of as being primarily the tidally um, emitted ejecta. Um, and so if you, uh, the middle panel over there, the solid curves are that canonical model of just um, basically what we saw in GW170817. Um, and the dashed curves are what happens if you add, make the lanthanide fraction higher by increasing the tidal tail. Uh, and what you see is that there's basically only a few differences and they tend to be in the longer wavelengths. So like the H band, which is I guess 1.6 microns um, and the five micron band. Uh, those are the main places that you would actually see an increased amount of tidal ejecta. So we have a constraint on that in the uh, thing that we actually observed, but in the future we need to make sure to not miss those, otherwise we might be missing the contribution of the tidal ejecta. Uh, and similarly, it, we need to make sure that we don't miss that early blue component because that is stuff that is uh, our process elements but lanthanide poor. Uh, and in this particular case, um, we, we got that, we managed to see it fast enough, but uh, if we see it a little bit later, we need to um, continue to do those very blue observations to make sure we catch that lanthanide core component. Uh, so the takeaway from this is uh, we have to be fairly fast. Within the first week of a gravitational wave trigger, we have to be able to see both the far infrared and the um, relatively blue in order to be robust about measuring our lanthanide fractions. Okay, so then the second question is, you know, the lanthanide fraction is not just a random number. It actually corresponds to different physical parameters. So how do you actually get higher lanthanide fractions inside of neutron star mergers. And there's sort of three different ways. The first one is you can amp up the contribution of the tidal ejecta. So for instance, if you make your binary mass ratio relatively high, or you have like a higher eccentricity, then you'll throw off larger amounts of tidal ejecta. Uh, this will also change depending on the neutron star equation of state or the spin. So that's the first way, you just make more of the most lanthanide rich material. Another way is you can suppress the blue kilonova component. Um, that early blue kilonova component from either the, um, from the collision or also from the early driven winds. Um, and so you can do that basically by making a black hole faster. So the blue kilonova, um, you get less of that when you have a black hole involved. Uh, and then the third way is most of the mass actually comes out in the disk winds. Um, so you can either somehow increase the lanthanide fraction of those disk winds or suppress the total amount of mass from those because they're a little bit lower than 10 to the minus 1.5. Uh, and basically what that corresponds to is you have to eject the disk faster um, or have like a, a smaller disk. Uh, so unfortunately, like all three of these ways are ways that uh, will make your kilonova uh, harder to observe. So all of these three things basically make the kilonova redder, shorter, and fainter. Um, and so I, maybe I won't go into the details of this um, model over here, but the point is we start with a canonical model and look at it. And then if you reduce the wind mass or uh, make most of the mass come out in a tidal tail, uh, the kilonova that you observe is going to be harder to observe. Um, so this is a little bit unfortunate, but at least we sort of know what the target has to be. It has to be we have to make sure that we're catching these uh, very high lanthanide fraction things in order to make this comparison that we've proposed. Okay, so going forward, um, 
uh, what are some questions that I have? Um, so I think uh, if you were listening to this, I hope you felt uneasy at several points in terms of when I was explaining how we're computing the lanthanide fractions, both in metal poor stars and in kilonova. Uh, and you know, we acknowledge this. We've done what we think is the best that you know, we can do right now. Um, but here's a list of things that I think are really important to account for. So the first thing is that I think on the metal poor star side, um, the most important uncertainty is we don't really know how good the solar pattern is at describing the, the abundances of um, our process elements in metal poor stars, right? And there's two main ways where I think that there's an issue. The first is that the elements in the first peak, that part is the most suspect, uh, it's, it's both most affected by how you subtract off the S process. And it's also the case that when we do look at metal poor stars, it seems like you know, uh, we don't have sort of this uh, shoulder in the masses. Uh, we actually have a turnover where you don't get all of the very light elements. So I think the first peak is too massive, which actually would increase all of our lanthanide fractions inferred from stars. Um, the second is variation in the second peak. So I assume that the elements in the second and third peak had the same ratio as the sun relative to the elements of the rare earth peak. Um, and that's, that's not actually that we, not actually something that we've constrained. So I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, we also did, you know, very hard cutoffs in atomic mass, and we were worried about contamination in our complete sample. Um, and we're also worried about actinides because we actually uh, ignored those. Um, from the kilonova perspective, I think one of the things that's going to be hardest is like viewing angle effects or hidden mass components. So like I talked about the fact that we only see the light that's coming out from the surface, but if there's just mass components on the inside, we'll be missing that. Um, and then there's, um, there's arguments that some of the early blue light might actually be from shocks and not from decaying R process elements. Um, there's all of the uncertainties going from opacities to lanthanide fractions. There's huge amounts of uncertainties that many people are not accounting for in terms of the heating, like what uh, the actual decays are happening and how those decays get translated into heating the ejecta. Um, and then of course, uh, uh, actinides could be possibly relevant. And so I think, you know, for on the metal poor star side, in order to make progress here, um, the thing that we need is going to be ultraviolet spectroscopy because that's going to solve most of our issues. Not all, but some. Um, and then on the kilonova side, basically, we, you know, these viewing angle effects, you can only basically deal with them by uh, seeing more kilonova at different orientations. Um, so I'm going to uh, briefly touch on two of these things, which I think are particularly interesting. So the variation in the second peak um, and the topic of actinides. Um, so again, just to point out, the, uh, we had the biggest, I think one of the big er issues with our extrapolation is we, because we don't actually measure elements in the second peak directly, uh, we do not uh, know if that's actually universal or not, right? So we have this universal pattern from barium through the third peak, uh, but we don't actually know if elements in the peak itself are varying or not. And there's different ways that you could get that to vary. So for instance, you could do fission cycling and dump more elements on top of that peak. Um, or maybe if you have very fine-tuned electron fractions, you can actually produce um, elements in the second peak without getting over the second peak. Um, so I think this is going to, uh, the R process alliance is, I'm really excited that they're going after this topic in particular. Um, and then moving on to the actinides. So the actinides um, are also high opacity elements uh, for the purposes of kilonova. And they're also sometimes seen in metal poor stars. Um, and one of the things that we now know is that actinides and lanthanides do not have similar uh, ratios inside of stars. This is an effect that's larger than the fact that the actinides are radioactive and decay. So this is not an age effect. Um, so this figure over here is just the distribution of thorium, which is a good actinide to measure, um, compared to europium, which is a lanthanide. Uh, and what you see is in the black histogram, you have these like this fairly wide and outlier distribution. So these are, um, yeah, these we, ha we, we see very clearly variations between the actinides to lanthanides. Um, we, I don't think we've quantified this distribution that well yet, but in the future, that would be quite interesting. Uh, and so the R process alliance, um, is pushing really hard on top of this. And there's a really nice paper from Erica Holmbeck um, sort of showing the types of things that you can do with this. Um, actinides, of course, are also important in actually thinking about the kilonova itself. Um, and it's because um, the lanthanides after the first day are basically constant in their abundance for the rest of the um, light curve. But ac the actinides continue to decay um, those are high opacity elements, and they're also injecting energy into the ejecta. And so that's actually going to affect what you see in your kilonova. Um, and so the lanthanide abundances don't change. And so in terms of the lanthanide fraction we measured, that's pretty good. But in kilonova, you're not measuring directly a lanthanide fraction. You're measuring an opacity, which includes both the lanthanides and actinides. And the actinides are changing over time. 
So I just think that's an interesting thing that people should be accounting for. I think most the people who do full models are doing this when they run the full uh, traces of nucleosynthesis, they do that, but not otherwise. Um, one of the things about the late time power of actinides is really interesting because um, different mass models will actually give you uh, different um, amounts of actinides and how much uh, they power the very late time light curve. So after the first 20 days, uh, a lot of the energy might actually be just from a few isotopes that are relatively long lived. And so propagate, uh, computing those exact abundances for those isotopes is really interesting. Uh, and we actually, uh, so the left over here is some models from Meng Wu showing that this is in fact possible. Um, and on the right over there is um, some Spitzer observations of the uh, very late time infrared observations that uh, may indicate the presence of, um, you know, primarily being heated by a couple of isotopes. Um, so I think that's still heavily debated. And one of the things that's really nice is that uh, once the James Webb Space Telescope comes online, it should be really good at measuring these late time things. Okay, so I want to very quickly say that, um, you know, we interpreted in this paper the lanthanide fraction in terms of um, differences between the sort of the bluer parts and the redder parts of a kilonova. Um, but if it's not neutron star mergers, there's other ways that you should see this lanthanide fraction variation inside of your nucleosynthesis site. So um, just saying that this distribution that we've measured in metal poor stars is going to be useful whether or not um, we think that neutron star mergers are the dominant source of our process polymers. Um, so to summarize, uh, you know, we, I think you know, many people think that the source of our process elements is like definitely neutron star mergers. Uh, I think, I personally think that it's still uncertain, although I'm not really sure, you know, I don't know what prior I'm assigning to all of the different things right now. Um, but if it is neutron star mergers, if the, metal, if the metal poor stars are enriched by neutron star mergers, future kilonova should definitely be more lanthanide rich. Um, so I think I will stop there and take questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to jump in and turn on your mics. All right. Well, I have a question if no one else does. Um, so you sort of hinted that we need sort of populations of kilonova to start placing constraints um, from that angle. Do you have a sense with current estimations of the, the merger rate, do you have a sense on how long it'll be before we have a sufficient population? That's a good question. Um, so I guess you know, six months ago, I was quite optimistic and I said, you know, it seems like, it seems like we're getting like one, you know, binary black hole merger a week on average and at least one candidate neutron star, neutron star or neutron star black hole merger um, every month or so. A lot of those neutron star black hole things have uh, ended, some of them have ended up being like glitches and some of them have ended up being uh, just so far that there's no hope of seeing um, a transient associated with it. Um, and so I, it, you know, in the past, like six months ago, I think I was thinking this will happen in like the next couple of years. We'll at least have like two or three more. If they all are lanthanide poor, uh, then we'll actually like know something interesting. Um, but now uh, I don't know. Um, so one of the things is that uh, CAGRA, which is the new gravitational wave detector, is going to come online soon, and that's going to make the localizations much better. And the problem right now is that the gravitational wave localizations are so big that we can't go very deep. Um, and so it's unlikely that we're going to be able to see the um, transients when they occur. But the, uh, yeah, so because, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you can't just see the gravitational waves. If you don't get good follow-up observations, then you can't count it over here. So it's a little harder than the people who are trying to do like standard sirens or something. Um, and so, okay, so if I had to make up a number, I don't know, five, 10 years, <laughs> I, 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 I truly don't know, so. Okay, no, that's fair, yeah. <laughs> I have a question. Hey, it's Hendrik. Um, I have a question. You, you looked at R1 and R2 stars, right? I looked at all stars, not just R1 and R2. So you included R0? Uh, because, um, I mean, those I think will be difficult to reconcile with mergers and would point to another source, basically a contamination of the first peak. Uh, I think you had it on your list. 
Yes, yeah, um, so contamination of the first peak. So just to, uh, oh, you can't see my mouse, but the right panel over here shows the uh, europium over iron distribution and the lanthanide fraction we infer from each one, assuming it's entirely due to our process. If you have contamination from things like neutrino-driven winds or something, uh, then you will increase the lanthanide fractions uh, at the low end of the, um, you can't see my mouse, okay, uh, at the, for the stars with europium over iron or like zero or less, um, those lanthanide fractions, my guess is, are a little bit too low. But I think, wouldn't it mean that the, the mergers should then uh, even have higher lanthanum fractions if, if you have another source that, that produces yeah. first peak? That's and that, that would push it further up. And then, then I'm wondering, uh, on your right column of systematic errors you had, is, is the blue component uh, all our process, right? And are we at a point where we could argue that if mergers are the main source of our process, then you must come up with some other explanation of at least part of the blue component? Yeah, I think that's a, a one possible argument. I don't think I would say I believe it. I, I, I would not say I think it's certain. Um, so the blue component, you know, one of the other ways you can get it is shocked material coming out. One of the things that, uh, a paper that came out recently basically says they think they identified strontium inside of that early blue component in like the first day and a half or so. Uh, if that's true, then I think that is pretty strong evidence that the blue component is primarily our process elements. Um, but even if you just take out um, the blue component entirely, uh, it depends on, uh, at that point, it's much less robust in terms of the uh, lanthanide fractions for the model. Some of them will get very high and some of them will get very low. Um, but even the high ones usually were about uh, 10 to the minus 2, which is still at the lower end of lanthanide fractions that we see in stars. And again, like in these systematics over here, basic, most of them, except for the H thing, are going to increase the lanthanide fractions that we infer from stars. So it's going to increase the tension between neutron star mergers and are the, the one neutron star merger uh, and what we see in metal core stars. So maybe the strontium observation points to mergers not being the dominant source. It's possible. I mean, but I think one of the things is that the, you know, if you think that these um, <coughs> R0 stars, if you think that the R0 stars are heavily contaminated and they're actually just what we see in the sun plus something else instead of variation within a single site, uh, then I think it already is hard, right? Because we rely on that tail to say that those two things are consistent right now. Uh, and so I think it to be, right now, actually, my uh, feeling is that um, neutron star mergers ex are probably exhibit more diversity in their lanthanide fractions, in their compositions, um, compared to what we you know, thought before. That, that's the direction I'm leaning. Um, but we'll find out, right, in like the next few years. Hey, Alex, it's Rick. Hey, Rick. Oh. Yeah. Hey, the other thing I was thinking, obviously, my, my kind of hobby horse is the mixing, right? So if we take into account, you know, non-homogeneous distribution of these materials, we could end up with a very, you know, a much wider spread in the resulting metal poor star population, depending on, you know, the time scale between the merger and the next generation of star formation. So that's, right. yeah, that's something I'm gonna try to look a little bit more at in dwarf in the context of dwarf galaxies. So. Yeah, so I don't think that's relevant. Okay, so the assumption that we made that makes this not relevant here, but although it might be relevant in the, once you really put everything together. So the assumption we made is that the stars we're looking at um, have only in, been enriched by one R process source. Um, you're not going to get differential mixing in the different ejecta components. It's just the time scales, they, they homogenize on, time, on galactic time scales. Um, so you're not going to get differences in that, but you will get differences in um, if you start mixing together two different um, R process sources uh, with different lanthanide fractions. And that's not a thing that we considered here, but it's definitely possible. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, hello, I have a question. So yes. can you hear me well? Yep. Okay, so um, I think it's a few years ago, we just have like 20 something R2 stars, and then probably less than 100 R1 stars. But now because of this uh, IPA 
you know, effort, you guys have like, I don't know, double or triple the number of stars now. Mm -hmm. So my question is that, um, you know, this our process is quite a rare event, but then it seems to be a lot more now. I mean, the, the based on the number of stars now we observe. So could you talk about something, you know, about the frequency or, um, you know, I, I think it's, I know that we have to really fully really understand what's the cause between the R1 and R2, but, you know, we have a lot more really, so. Yeah, um, so I guess, you know, in some sense, the, the total number, I guess, is less important than the fraction of stars that have been in these categories. And my understanding, although I, I could be wrong and maybe Erica or Ian or someone else from the RPA can say something, but uh, the fractions are, are sort of wiggling around a little bit, but not too much compared to what we saw before. Yeah. <laughs> I can't tell if someone was going to... Yeah, but I, I think, um, yeah, in, in terms of the fraction of stars, um, I think it's pretty similar, even though the total number is increasing. And so what the total number increasing is going to do is it's going to let us, you know, we have enough to measure the lanthanide fraction in the way that I did over here, um, but not enough, for instance, to measure the thorium to europium um, fraction, which is like the variation in the actinides. Um, and that's the sort of thing that I'm, you know, that's the sort of, one of the things that I'm very excited about with that. Mm -hmm. Um, but in terms of the total number, you know, one of, you know, the R process is rare, but, you know, rare things happen all the time <laughs> uh, when you <laughs> look in a big enough box. Um, and so uh, I'm not that surprised by the, the, the rarity. Okay. Thank you. Oh, so what, one one uh, extended question. So that that we think that these R stars are kind of especially R two stars. We thought you know they're born in the dwarf galaxy system, and then then you know created into our own galaxy. Then I don't know you know the time that they're that that's happening probably really early on, and then I don't know how many stars are born after that you know merger and then created into a galaxy. So that's why my yeah, that's a really right, good. The, the fraction, yeah, fraction is kind of to me very still questioning. You know, yeah, it seems to be uh, too many <laughs> uh, stars. Yeah, that was the origin. Maybe another way to say that is uh, the, and this is an important thing, right? So the assumption that I made here is that each star that we're observing is from an independent gas reservoir, but it might be the case that most of the that if there's if most of the stars are from like the same galaxy and were enriched by the same thing, um, mm -hmm. then that is not correct, right? Sure, uh, sure, so you sure. have to take care of the correlation there. Um, and to be honest, I don't really know. Uh, I don't think we can account for that right now. The way that you mm -hmm. could is you could start grouping stars kinematically into components and saying yeah. all of these stars have the same abundance. Uh, and so therefore, uh, and they have the same kinematics, and so therefore we should count them as one thing in this histogram over here. Um, I think that's yeah. totally reasonable, but uh, that's not something we did. Okay. Interesting. All right, any final questions? No takers. All right, well, let's thanks Alex again. The unfortunate thing with everyone having their microphones muted is that you can't clap, but uh, <laughs> Thank it was you a all. great talk. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Great talk, Alex. Thanks. <laughs>